Well, good morning again. Glad that you could join us this morning as we open God's Word together. Uh, today, uh, actually, we, we come to the end of our study of the life and ministry of Moses. I, I hope that you've found it to be valuable and uh, challenging for your own life. Last week, we looked at uh, some of Moses' final words, his final address, as we find it in the book of Deuteronomy, where he lays out for one last time the things that he considers to be of first importance, that he wanted to make sure that the people of Israel would not forget or neglect. But at the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, in the final chapter, we find there the record of Moses' death. And uh, the writer who, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, adds this um, obituary, we could perhaps call it, uh, onto the end of this book, gives in the final verses this eulogy. He says, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. No question that Moses was an amazing guy, a great man of God, as we've seen through this study. And he continues to have an incredible influence, even long after his death. You know, echoing the words uh, there at the end of Deuteronomy, we might say that there's nobody like Moses, except, except that earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses himself makes this interesting statement in chapter 18 and verse 15. He says to the people of Israel, this is what God has told me, that he is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to him. Who's he talking about? Well, most Bible scholars consider this to be a messianic prophecy. That is to say that it was a prophecy about the Messiah who was to come. And the New Testament certainly understands it as such. Peter, for example, in his sermon uh, in Acts chapter 5, identifies this passage in Deuteronomy with Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. And so the New Testament reveals to us that one who is greater than Moses has come. He's come to deliver us, not from slavery in Egypt, but from slavery to sin. He's the one who would fulfill the law and the prophets. So Jesus came to live among us, fully God and fully man. And so as we finish our uh, study of Moses this morning, I want to take you to one more passage, but this time in the New Testament. Uh, Turn, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke and to chapter 9, Luke 9. This this same episode in Jesus' life is also recorded in Matthew chapter 17 and in Mark chapter 9, but we're going to focus this morning on Luke's account. This passage describes what's come to be called the Transfiguration. So I invite you to follow along as I read verses 28 to 36. Luke 9, 28 to 36. Here's what it says. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. (laughs) Can you imagine what it must have been like to have experienced that? To to have been there in that moment, uh, seeing Jesus in all of his glory? Can can you imagine? Can can you put yourself in their sandals for, for a moment? I mean, what an amazing experience. There was Jesus... I mean, the Jesus that they knew, the Jesus that they traveled with for almost three years by then, their their friend, their teacher, there was Jesus glorified before their very eyes. And there were Moses and Elijah, arguably two of the greatest heroes in Jewish history that every Jew would be thrilled to meet. There they were. How were they 
how were the disciples able to identify them as Moses and Elijah since they'd never seen them before? I don't really know, but it seems to have somehow been clear to them that that's who they were. Interestingly, you know, if you remember your Old Testament, um, both of these men, both Moses and Elijah, had had encounters with God on a mountaintop before. Both had seen something of God's glory. Do you remember that? Elijah on the, on the mountain, the, the earthquake, the wind, the fire, and then the quiet whisper of God. Moses, of course, spent 40 days on the mountain with God. And it says that Moses' face actually shone when he came down off the mountain because it it reflected something of of the glory of God, of having been in the presence of the Lord. And now here they are again on another mountaintop in another encounter with God whose glory is so, so vividly and brilliantly displayed there in Christ. And it tells us that Moses and Elijah and Jesus were talking together. What were they talking about, we may wonder? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Only Luke adds this particular detail uh, in his account. Look at verse 31 here. They spoke, Luke says, about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. What does that mean, his departure? Are they talking about when he would ascend into heaven? Well, no. It says instantly that he would bring it to fulfillment at Jerusalem. That's maybe a kind of a strange way of saying it. So what does it mean? Well, you know, it's very interesting here that when Luke talks about Jesus' departure, he doesn't use the the common Greek word that he might have used in in that place. Instead, the the word that he uses here for departure is the word exodus. They spoke, Luke says, of his exodus. What's that remind you of? What's that that bring to mind? Moses, right? And And the exodus from Egypt. The deliverance of the people from slavery. It brings to mind the Passover and the the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. The blood that was put on the doorpost there so that the death angel would pass over. It's it's all there. So what departure are they talking about here? I believe that what they're talking about is the cross. They're talking about our deliverance from slavery to sin through the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. All All that we saw foreshadowed back in the book of Exodus is coming to its complete fulfillment here in Jesus. You know, if you look back a few verses in this same chapter, you will find that Jesus had been talking to his disciples, too, about his death. It was something that was hard for them to understand, to grasp. What do you mean? What do you mean you're going to die? In fact, both Matthew and Mark record that Peter actually rebuked Jesus. It's not going to happen, he said. I won't let it. And you remember that Jesus responds with some pretty strong words, saying, Get behind me, Satan. He says, You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but but the things of men. And now here they are on the mountain, and they're seeing Jesus in all of his glory. And and Peter, in essence, says, This is more like it. This, This is how it ought to be. Let everybody see your glory, your power. Show them who you really are. Set up your kingdom. Let's not talk about the suffering and rejection and death. This this is the way to go. He he still doesn't really get it, does he? He he doesn't understand or accept God's plan or the path that that Jesus was to follow. He had some things to learn. No, actually, I think that there are some things that all of us can learn from the transfiguration. What's this about? Why, why Why did this even happen? What's the lesson for us here in this account of the transfiguration? Well, let me mention uh, three things that I, that I believe that this passage brings to our attention that are important for all of us to, to get a handle on and to apply in our own lives. And the first thing I want us to notice is that this story is evidence of what Scripture constantly hints at, and that is that there's more than what we see. That we really only have the merest glimpse of who God is, of what He's doing, and of what's happening in the spiritual realm. You may remember from uh, your science class in school talking about the light spectrum, right? The colors that are visible to our human eye. But we also learned that there are other light frequencies that are not visible to our eye. Infrared, for example, on the one end of the spectrum and ultraviolet on the other end, not to even mention X-rays and gamma rays and all sorts of others. So our eyes only see a, a certain limited part of the spectrum of what is really out there. And we could perhaps say this, the same is true in the spiritual realm. Here on the Mount of Transfiguration, God pulls back the curtain, so to speak, and gives us a glimpse of another reality. We see Jesus in all of his pre-incarnate glory. That is, the glory that he had before he put on human flesh. 
It's a glory that's not been obliterated, certainly, but that has been veiled in His humanity. But the point is that there's more than what we can see with our eyes. And for this one instant, we, we see Jesus as He really is. Jesus in all of His glory. Remember that scene in The Wizard of Oz when they, when they finally get in to see the wizard and there's all this amazing and terrifying pyrotechnics, you know, fire and smoke and this booming voice and all of that. But then the curtain is pulled back and what we discover is that behind it all is a very ordinary man. Well, here it's really the opposite, isn't it? Here is God, veiled in human flesh, seemingly very ordinary, but then the curtain is pulled back and what we discover is that behind it all is one whose glory is unequaled and whose power is immeasurable, who who is anything but ordinary. Remember that story from the Old Testament when the king of Aram has sent an entire army to capture the prophet Elisha and he has this city surrounded and, and Elisha's servant gets up in the morning to get his cup of coffee, you know, and he he sees this army there all of a sudden. He he kind of freaks out. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Oh, my, we're doomed, you know. And and Elijah says, relax, relax. God has this under control. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And, And he asked God to open his servant's eyes. And when he did, it says that he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. There were things going on in the spiritual realm that he wasn't even aware of. Listen, we live in a time when what we see and hear and encounter with our natural senses doesn't look so good, does it? But Scripture reminds us that behind the scenes, behind the curtain, the King reigns in all of His glory and power and authority. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of that, don't we? Faith, the the, the book of Hebrews reminds us, is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Often the circumstances that we do see can leave us feeling kind of like Elisha's servant. Oh, what are we going to do? How are we going to face this, right? But let's put our faith in what we cannot see. That our God is a, is a great and mighty God. That He holds not just us, but the entire universe in the palm of His hand. When you're done viewing this, I, I encourage you to take a moment to, to read Isaiah chapter 40. It's, it's another passage that kind of pulls back the court curtain and shows us who our God really is. Isaiah says, yeah, yeah, we're we're like grass, (laughs) but let me tell you about God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? He says, the Lord is an everlasting God. He doesn't grow tired or weary. He gives strength to the weary and power to the weak. So be encouraged. There's, There's much more than what you can see. Whatever you think your God is, he's just that much more. And he is, he's the one, it says in Ephesians 3, who is able, you remember, to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in this. You know, I imagine those three disciples never looked at Jesus quite the same again because they had had an experience that had taught them that there was much more than what they could see, that he was far beyond what they had imagined, and that his power and glory make, make, make our issues seem small and insignificant in comparison. Now, the second lesson that I believe is that it's important that we take from this passage has to do with the centrality of Jesus, that he always belongs at the center. If there was any doubt about the identity of Christ and his claim to lordship, it was put to rest there on the mountain. If there was any doubt about who belonged at the, at the center, the, the voice there settles it once and for all, doesn't it? Jesus is without question the lead character in this scene, the undisputed focus. So we may say, well, what what are Moses and Elijah doing here then? Well, Moses and Elijah were, of course, two of the most significant figures in Jewish history, and we could say that here they represent the law and the prophets. So, So why are they here? Well, both the law and the prophets point forward to the one who would come, to the one who would be the the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And now here he is, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God in human flesh. So Moses and Elijah really only serve just to kind of turn the spotlight on Jesus. It's clearly not about them. They, they, they take second place next to this central character in this account. They, they kind of recede into the background. Maybe that's part of the reason why Peter's suggestion doesn't seem to have been accepted or adopted. Let's build three tabernacles, he says, three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Remember when we were studying a few weeks ago about the tabernacle, and we said that the tabernacle was, among other things, a place where God's glory was on display. 
And we, we kind of trace that idea of a tabernacle through Scripture. And we saw, for example, how the Old Testament prophets hinted that there would come a day when God would come to live among his people in a whole new way. And now that has happened in Jesus. Jesus, John tells us in his gospel, became flesh and, and made his dwelling. And the word there is the word for tent or tabernacle. It's the same word that Peter uses here. He tabernacled. He came to live among us. And we have seen his glory, John says, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, when John wrote those words, he may very well have been remembering back to this very experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. But, but, but my point is this, that they didn't need three tabernacles on the mountain that day. They already had one, Jesus, and that's all that they needed. Jesus was there, God in human flesh, tabernacling among us, living among us, and the very glory of God was manifested in him. Sure, Moses and Elijah were important figures, but the only one who really counted that day was Jesus. And he's the one who Moses was speaking of, you know, when, when he said that God would raise up a prophet from among them. And in fact, this is the one who's been pointed to all throughout our study of Moses. I mean, we, we've seen him in the Passover. We, we've seen him uh, as the one who delivers us from slavery. We've seen him as the, as the bread from heaven, the, the, one, the one lifted up on a pole, the rock that gives us living water, the tabernacle where God lives among us. He was the Lord, our banner, uh, our healer, our deliverer, our provider. All through the story of Moses, we are constantly being pointed toward Christ. And now, here is Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, and what is he doing? He's pointing us to Christ. He's the one at the center of all things. He's the one at, at, at the center of the worship that's going on now in heaven and, and will go on for eternity when all of creation is singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He's at the center of all things. But the question is if he has the central place in your life now. That, that's the issue. Does he occupy the throne of your life? That's his rightful place. Does he have central place? Well, listen, don't, don't put him to one side. Let him be the center of your life. Now, the final point that I want to make today is one that we really can't miss because God himself says it so clearly right here in the text. Listen to him, he says. That is, listen to Jesus. In fact, if you'll remember, that's the very thing that Moses says as well about the one who is to come. God, God will raise up for you a prophet, he says, like me from among you, uh, from your fellow Israelites, and you must what? You must listen to him, he says. And, and let me be quick to point out that uh, in the Bible, the idea of listening always includes obedience. If, if you don't obey, then you really haven't listened. Now, it, it's almost amusing here in this passage to see what happens to Peter, isn't it? It's, it's classic Peter, really. He's the first one to blurt something out. He, he usually is. <laughs> Mark's Gospel tells us that Peter didn't know what to say, but typical of Peter, he goes ahead and said something anyway. It's never stopped him before, right? <laughs> and, and as we've seen, it was not really a very helpful or appropriate suggestion. And the funny thing is that God interrupts him. Did, did you notice that it says that it was while he was speaking that a cloud covered them and a voice came? While Peter was still talking, God interrupts and says, This is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. It's almost as if God interrupts Peter while he's speaking and in essence says, Shut up, Peter. This is my son. He's the one you ought to be listening to. Right? The declaration of the voice from heaven is, is such a simple statement, really, but at the same time, it's so profound. First of all, it makes very clear, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus' identity. This is my son. That by itself should clear up a lot of things, shouldn't it, about Jesus and who he is. But then it also tells us what to do about that, how to respond. And it states it very simply. Listen to him. Listen to him. And my question for you is, are you listening? Are you listening to him? You know, many years ago, some of our Alliance missionaries in West Africa established a radio station as a means of reaching out to people and to tribal groups that they were unable to reach by any other means. And it was, it was greatly successful. But the problem at the very beginning was that, I mean, sure, you can set up a radio station, but it won't do a bit of good if no one has a radio, right? <laughs> You've got to have a way for them to receive the signal that you're broadcasting. So 
part of the plan as they were launching this radio ministry was to go out to all these little villages across their target area and to give out radios. And that's what they did. But these radios were very, very basic. And they were set up to receive only one frequency, <laughs> the frequency of the Alliance radio station. Certainly simplifies things, doesn't it? You know, what shall we listen to on the radio? Well, there's only one choice. <laughs> Let's listen to that. And, and I have no doubt that it would simplify our lives a great deal if we were only tuned in to God's frequency, if we only heard His voice and followed His way. But the truth is, as we well know, that we pick up lots of other frequencies, don't we? Lots of other messages, lots of other viewpoints. And many times they're crowding out God's frequency, God's voice in our lives. We need to tune our lives in again to His frequency, if you will, to listen to His voice. That alone will solve a great many problems and resolve a great many issues for us if we will just listen to Him and live in obedience to Him. But I'm afraid that we are often forming our viewpoints and perspectives and making our decisions in life and determining what's true and right based on many other voices that are not the voice of Christ. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. Get into His Word. Find out what He says, what He's thinking, where His heart is. Listen to Him. I hope you'll go away uh, from this message this morning with the words of the voice from heaven echoing in your ears. This is my Son. Listen to Him. Are you listening to Him? Do you hear His voice? Are you doing what He says? Why do we finish our study of Moses this way, with this particular passage? Well, because I want us to finish by bringing it around again to where Moses himself would want the focus to be. If we come away from this studying saying, I should try and be more like Moses, then we've kind of missed the point. Yeah, there are things that we can and should learn from his example, but Christ is the only one who can transform us from the inside out. He's our only hope for, for freedom, for forgiveness, for new life. He's the one who belongs at the center of our lives. He's the one we should be listening to. We've learned a lot from Moses, or at least I have. I hope you have too. But what I really want you to take away from this study is that you will have encountered Christ in a new way. Listen, if you've put your hope in something else this morning, something other than Christ, can, can I point you to Him? Can I tell you that all that you need you can find in Him? There's no one like this Christ. Let's acknowledge this morning His right to be at the very center of our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, for this man Moses. We thank you for his life and his commitment to you. We thank you for what we've learned along the way. But Lord Jesus, today we recognize how much we need you. Moses is a great example, but he can't give us the power to live that way. He can't change us or forgive us or free us or indwell us, but, but you can. And so we pray today that you might you might pull back the curtain that we might know you more. We pray that you might take the center place in our lives. And we pray that we might be sensitive to your voice and live in obedience to what you say. And this we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.